So welcome all to our first keynote speech for the Tax Research Network Conference 2021. My name is Professor Andy Limer. I am pleased to be the chair of the Tax Research Network and also the host for the conference this year. So I have great pleasure in introducing our first keynote speaker for this year's conference, my friend uh, and colleague and co-author, because uh, we're working on a book together, Professor Adrian Sinfield. Uh, Adrian is a Emeritus Professor of Social Policy at Edinburgh University. Huge thanks, uh, Adrian, for being willing to join us at this year's conference. Thank you for giving us some of your time. I think it would be really useful, as um, uh, uh, our audience might not all know you, perhaps if you could give me just a little bit of uh, a, a, a short summary of your, of your career to date, so that people get a bit of a feel for the sorts of areas that you've worked in and, uh, and, and, and why you're being invited to give us our keynote speech today. Right, I'll try and keep that brief because accidents and luck have been a major part of this. But I came into social policy through the World Refugee Year when I was a student and got involved in the way in which different groups were being treated in our society. I spent a year in Hong Kong working with refugee issues there. When I came back, I went to the London School of Economics and was very lucky to be working with Titmus, um, who I'll be mentioning in a moment, and with Peter Townsend, who's probably one of the leading people in uh, uh, the industrial world to look at issues of poverty and inequality. I then moved to Edinburgh and over this period of time, I was working, first of all, on issues of unemployment because I got my first job working with Peter because unemployment had reached half a million. And that was seen as an outstandingly high level in comparison to the low levels just after the war. But then I worked in that area for perhaps 15 years and became increasingly concerned that if one wanted to understand the issue of unemployment, one had to understand the way in which the labour market was working. And it then became clearer that resources were going to certain people that were not public in terms of tax reliefs and other forms of benefits that I'll be talking about in a moment. And this became more and more of a concern to me so that from 1980 on, I was teaching an honours course on social division of welfare, which included a large component of taxation. And I've carried on with this uh, ever since trying to work with colleagues in other countries and I'm really one of the great beneficiaries of the European community because during the Erasmus and Tempest exchange schemes, I was able to work with colleagues in other countries who shared a similar interest and we built up a, an exchange group. And now we in fact have a, a British social policy taxation uh, and social policy group, which has been meeting. And of course, now we're working together with you um, looking at editing a book on taxation and social policy. So you've uh, you, you've done quite an exciting range of things that I think enable you to have quite a unique perspective on where does tax fit within a uh, a social policy realm uh, and the setting of effective social policy. It just, just could you give us a definition of social policy, uh, Adrian? What 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 is social policy as as far as you're concerned? Well, the standard one we give to uh, students and parents is social policy is about the welfare state and what it does. But in fact, that's very much uh, uh, a limited picture. And really, it's the levels of unemployment, the quality of the health service, but also the quality of the society that makes people dependent on the health service. So that one clearly has to go outside individual policies. And that immediately takes us into taxation, because if you want to look at how resources are being allocated in a society, it's how they're collected as well as how they're distributed that becomes very important. And, and presumably, uh, uh, so no, it, 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 tax is important both as a, as a revenue generator to support the cost of delivering social policy, but, but, but also I, I, I know as you're going to talk about today in, in the context of tax expenditure, it also is about... Uh, how it affects people's behaviours and tax can have a direct impact on achieving social policy objectives. Yeah, it, extremely uh, important, and I think we've been long taking a long time to realise the way in which taxation works helps to shape the society we live in. Yeah, absolutely. And and and, and so, where many of the people who are listening to the uh, to the to the to the talk today and would consider themselves 
I suspect, to be tax specialists above specialists in, in, in other disciplines. How can tax specialists uh, be more effective in achieving impacts in the social policy space, do you think? Well, I think they've already been uh, very influential. And in fact, uh, Stanley Surrey, whom I've been mentioning, was an, a tax lawyer at Harvard. And he was one of the crucial people for opening up this whole area. And I think uh, this has been increasing in, in spasms. So that when the first edition of tax, so Taxation and Social Policy came out in 1980, there was a gathering momentum then to pick up the issues with people in tax and economics and so on. And this just seemed to dry, dry up and it hopefully is picking up again now helped by the fact that there's much more comparative data. That's fantastic, Adrian. And, and uh, hopefully people will now get a, a, an idea of why I was so excited when you agreed to, to give us a, a keynote speech, um, because you're bringing such an interesting both background and wealth of knowledge in being engaged in all the sorts of things that your profile uh, that people can read on the website say you've done with organizations at national and international level around setting and determining and influencing effective social policy over, uh, uh, over, your, uh, over your career, but also have a particular interest in tax and where tax plays a role in us developing uh, and improving our society. And so I'm really uh, excited to hear what you have to say to us now about one particular aspect that I know you've been working on uh, most recently, looking at the aspect of understanding and influencing tax expenditures. So um, uh, with no further ado, I'll hand over to you uh, to, to, to begin and deliver your presentation if, uh, if, if, if that's acceptable. Thank you very much, Adrian, for being willing to do that for us today. Well, thank you very much. I'm very glad to have this opportunity to try and uh, persuade you that it's very important that people working in my area and tax experts like yourselves should be more in contact with each other and collaborating in various ways. Next slide, please, Andy. What I want to concentrate on is that these two issues are tax expenditures and fiscal welfare. And consider after giving you a brief indication of what they're about, why they matter. And I think probably the best quotation I've ever come across about taxation is by the uh, finance minister to the Sun King, Louis XIV of France. The act of taxation consists in so plucking the goose as to obtain the largest amount of feathers with the least amount of hissing. And I think uh, Colbert had a very good idea of the importance of the politics of taxation. And part of the politics is that tax reliefs have been much neglected, even though they play a very important role in maintaining or even strengthening people's resources, as opposed to the constant discussion there is about can we afford the welfare state, which now includes so many means-tested public spending benefits, which are constantly being cut back. Then I want to finish with some proposals to show how we might go forward. Next slide, please, Andy. Fiscal welfare was something that was introduced in the 1950s by Richard Titmus, who was the first professor of social administration, we now call it social policy, and he talked about the social division of welfare. Alongside a whole range of issues like then called family allowances, now child benefit, there were child tax allowances, there were marriage allowances, there are still tax reliefs helping people build up their pension. We used to have for many years help to enable people to buy their own homes. But these tax government interventions were not taken into account as public welfare. They weren't included in the budget. Alongside these two items of public welfare and fiscal welfare was a third, occupational welfare. Company pensions would be a particularly good example. Company cars would be another. And these were often much encouraged by tax reliefs. So the two are often self-maintaining, self but outside the public budget. At the same time as Titmus was working on this constant idea of fiscal welfare, Stanley Surrey, an American uh, Harvard tax lawyer who eventually moved up to have an important role in the uh, Johnson, LBJ Johnson uh, government of the late 1960s and introduced the first tax expenditure budget, which was eventually enacted into law and has been continuing every year since 1974. And 
Surrey deliberately used the term tax expenditure to parallel the term public expenditure, because he said through these tax expenditures, these tax reliefs, the government was running spending policies through the tax system. That was eventually picked up inter internationally by OECD, later by uh, IMF, but the definitions in different countries vary quite considerably as the global tax expenditure database is brought out this year. The UK was very reluctant to move into this area and eventually published its first list, but by no means a budget in 1978. Next slide, please. Just to give you some sense of the way in which uh, HMRC treats tax reliefs, they've now classified it into structural and non-structural. And they define structural as largely integral parts of the tax structure, which include defining the scope of the tax, calculating income or profits correctly, and making the tax progressive or to simplify. By contrast, they have a non-structural category, which is to help or encourage particular types of individuals, activities, or products in order to achieve social, uh, economic or social objectives. And this is set out in their most recent document, but they've been developing this in very similar terms for the last decade or so, but they've cut it down now to two measures. It's a very poor definition. Why is making tax progressive not non-structural? Because it helps or encourages particular types of individuals. And there are a whole range of ways in which the, op the classification doesn't seem to work. And I think really behind it is the fact that while something is structural, the tax authorities remain in charge of it and they don't allow anybody else to discuss it. Next slide, please. Just to give you some of their facts on tax reliefs and the latest ones released, they put the total cost of those they estimate and they only estimate uh, the costs of 196 at 426 billion. The great majority of these are structural, but they're only based on 87 estimates, which come to 271 billion. The non-structural are only 362, but they're based on 111 estimates, which come to 155 billion pounds, which is round about 7% of GDP. And about a just over a third of the total cost of tax reliefs that are estimated. Now, the Global Tax Expenditure Dace Database says that there are 575 tax expenditures, which is equivalent to the non-structural ones, as opposed to 362. And I'm trying to work out why they reached a different decision. They think it's equivalent to about seven and a half uh, of uh, gross domestic product, making Britain one of the highest uh, spenders on tax expenditures. But clearly classification is a matter of power and control. If you read Margaret Hodge's marvelous memoir on chairing the uh, Public Accounts Committee, or just looking at the National Audit Office's latest report on the management of tax expenditures, you see very quickly how the issue of who controls uh, various parts of the tax system are quite crucial to the HMRC and the Treasury. And Margaret Hodge was, is very entertaining on this. Next slide, please. So many of us have now been arguing for more accountability. Should the costs of reliefs be revealed and taken into account? If not, why not? The Treasury was so angry with the National Audit Office when it published its first report back in 2014 on tax reliefs that they insisted on it inserting various paragraphs that really claimed that what was being not collected on tax reliefs was not real money. And it's almost a yes minister uh, example. Now, if you take a specific example, job seekers allowance is much discussed in terms of social policy, a public welfare benefit now being merged into universal credit. That and all its spending is included in the budget. But there's a 30,000 pound tax relief for redundancy payments. And these are private ones because the, uh, the state redundancy payment is nowhere near 30,000 pounds. The cost of 
job seeks allowance per week per head is about 75 pounds. If you add the tax reliefs and the national insurance reliefs on the redundancy scheme, it is almost double, 130 pounds. That's the first one is visible. The second one doesn't appear in budgets and is tucked away in one table published uh, once a year, really quite obscurely. So the impact and value for money is even more neglected, but clearly it's vital in the broader context where taxes work to shape society. One wants to know how the tax system is operating and what impact it's having and at whose expense. Next slide, please. Now, just to put you in context for this, because so many discussions of inequality are based on what has happened last year or the last few years. If you take this picture that goes from 1960 up to 2017, you can see that the really big change was during the 1980s under the Thatcher administration. And this really was quite dramatic widening of inequality in our society. Since then, there've been various ups and downs, but it's more or less as it was at the end of the 1980s. And despite a whole range of policies, it hasn't greatly improved. Next slide, please. And I thought I'd just put this in a, a comparative context as well. This takeoff of uh, Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby is drawing out the comparison between, or the relationship between low levels of inequality and problems of poverty. And, and sorry, low levels of social mobility and high levels of inequality. And you can see that Italy, the United Kingdom and the United States are right at the top right hand corner with the least uh, social mobility and in consequence, the highest inequality. In fact, not entirely sure which way around it goes. But what it does mean is that these countries have much more poverty and people are in it for longer because they're not able to move out of it. Next slide, please. So who gets what? It's astonishing that HMRC only provides one regular table, which is very limited indeed on who gets what. And just half the taxpayers draw any benefit from income tax reliefs in the last analysis I carried out. 9%, mostly men with incomes over 50,000 pounds, received over half of the total income tax reliefs. The other information that comes out on this is only via PQs pushed by various MPs, but not seen as in any way a regular job of the uh, HMRC or the Treasury. In uh, one particular analysis that the Institute of Fiscal Studies carried out for 2004 to 5, the top 0.1% had 86 times more extra relief than average, but only 31 times more pre-tax income. And that helps to explain how tax reliefs provide an important role in helping to maintain or even widen inequalities in our society. And I should add the national insurance reliefs were not even discussed, not even mentioned, let alone discussed in that analysis. So next slide, please. And this is one that's appeared in the Treasury Committee, which shows that the top 10% get half the value of the tax reliefs on pensions, whereas the bottom half only get 10% of that value. And that has not been published by uh, the Treasury. Uh, and again, it's an example of how both the Treasury and HMRC see getting data on distribution very unimportant. And national insurance is still missing out of that. Next slide, please. So this is just to give you a picture of what, after all the tax reliefs and everything else, the resources look like across society. You can see if you look at the top right hand corner that in terms of all taxes, not just income tax, all taxes, the average is 35.8. It hasn't moved a great deal. I also showed in Intalic the figures for 08, 09. The top fifth are not that much heavier taxed at 37.5 of their total of their gross income. But the bottom fifth are at 42.4. And in fact, this has widened over the last few years. And this is before the, the effect of the pandemic. And it's largely, as you can see from the bottom line, the way in which indirect tax 
is falling very heavily on the bottom fifth. And the council taxes are regressive. So we don't really have a progressive tax system. At best, it's proportional. In fact, it's in many ways regressive. Next slide, please. So we really need much greater emphasis on distribution. Why don't the National Audit Office and select committees demand much more from HMRC and the Treasury on who gets what? And I'm really puzzled by this. And there's really a big question is who benefits from these reliefs? How much did the building industry benefit from all the tax reliefs and the, uh, the mortgage interest tax relief scheme? How are pension uh, funds as well as employers benefiting from the tax reliefs and national insurance exemptions for uh, pensions? This has very long been resisted by the Treasury. In fact, in 1985, I had my only chance to speak to quite a senior Treasury official, and he was very candid. He said if the Minister of Housing was, had some control over the amount of tax relief that was going out on uh, owner occupation, they might well say, well, actually, I'm going to cut back on this and spend some of it on slums, and we wouldn't have control of these reliefs. It's absolutely impossible. And in fact, he was totally dismissive of the work that OECD was doing on uh, tax expenditures at the time and, and said we had absolutely no attention of repeating that. Next slide, please. So we need a broader analysis. In social policy, we've long distinguished two things. Universal schemes that go to everybody, like the National Health Service, uh, you can go privately. Uh, it's primary and secondary education, again, you can go privately, but it's available to everybody. By contrast, there's a whole range of measures, including universal credit, where people only get their benefits depending on the resources they've got. I want to argue that if we're going to take into account tax reliefs as well, we need to consider not just the means tested public spending benefits, but the means enhancing private tax reliefs opposed to tax credits, upside down benefits, Stanley Sari called them. It's a form of reverse targeting. And there's a strong case here for much greater collaboration between people in social policy and in, in taxation to see how this is working out. Next slide, please. Of course, it's not just income tax reliefs. I've mentioned national insurance contributions and uh, uh, Murley is one of the, the real tax experts suggested that pensioners should be paying national insurance contributions. There's a the council tax, the elephant in the room, non-updating non of the valuation and business rates with often significant uh, tax reliefs. Indirect taxes, and Andy, you're exploring the extent and impact of this with Michael Collins in, in Ireland. Wealth taxes, is it very interesting that last weekend, the ex-head of uh, HMRC, said these are massive tax reliefs for business and agriculture, do not have any credible economic arguments. Certainly nothing like that appeared um, when he was operating like this, let alone previously when he was working as a tax expert and was very critical of uh, the uh, tightness of the tax system. So it's greatly wealth enhancing as well as means enhancing. Next slide, please. The World Bank and OECD, neither of them are hardly radical ones, have talked about the way in which tax expenditures violate, it's a strong word for the World Bank, vertical and horizontal equity alike. OECD has talked about the problem is that there's a failure to try on the part of government. An out of sight, out of mind attitude can arise and continue to in insulate inefficiencies from scrutiny for periods of years. And I would argue it insulates inequalities as well as inefficiencies. And more recently, they've come out with a very specific to promote inclusive growth. Tax bases should be broadened first by removing or reducing tax expenditures that disproportionately benefit high income groups. But we don't actually have enough information uh, besides the pensions ones to know what these are. Next slide, please. So I would want to argue that part of this third uh, part of the framework would be put tax and public spending together uh, side by side. If you do this with uh, spending on older people, 
you find that the tax and national insurance contribution exemptions add another third to the spending on older people. But only the two thirds that's public spending is included in any budgets. The United States used to include this in the past, but then the government changed and they dropped it, although there were proposals to bring it out again. The same thing happened in Canada. So it's clearly a highly political as well as economic financial issue. And there's a continuing resistance to uh, tax expenditure budgeting. Next slide, please. One of the ways in which you might see this is to take the ONS um, data, which was part of the table I showed you later earlier on tax incidents. And you can see here that the uh, tax being taken by people pulls the amount of support that higher income groups towards the right, uh, the phone on the right is the average, uh, pay more taxes and get less benefits. But next slide, if you were to include the tax reliefs as well, it might well look like this. In fact, the boxes on the left, the empty boxes on the left would be smaller uh, and the, the benefits to the better off according to the IFS study uh, would be even bigger still. So we need this sort of information to decide what we want to be doing with the resources available to us in our society. Next one, please. This is brought out in some UN work with confirmed with the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. They required countries to take account of all maximum available resources. But so far, no reliefs have been included in this, nor demanded. And when uh, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights came to Britain and looked at what we were doing, he said austerity could easily have sp spared the poor if the political will had existed to do so. So while the cost of tax reliefs is hidden away, it's one more factor that's weakening that political will. Next slide, please. So just to conclude, I think we, it's about time we started to hold tax expenditures and fiscal welfare to account. And I think this is a marvelous opportunity for collaboration uh, between our two areas. If we don't, taxes will continue to maintain, strengthen and normalize poverty and inequality because people don't realize what's happening. It fits very nicely with what Richard Tawney said before the First World War. What thoughtful rich people call the problem of poverty, thoughtful poor, pe poor people call with equal justice a problem of riches. The Royal Commission on Income Tax in the 1920s included a comment by the only woman member, Lillian Knowles, that tax expenditures are hidden bounties. And she was very critical of them. And sadly, uh, that was not picked up and pursued. It would have been wonderful if it had been from the 1920s onward. So I think, really think there's a really great opportunity and incentive for accountants and social policy analysts to work much more closely together. And I think that's all the more vital and urgent under the increasing pressures of the pandemic and climate crisis. Thank you very much. Professor Sinfield, thank you very much uh, for, for, for that as our uh, uh, first keynote speech for Tax Research Network 2021 annual conference. That was tremendous. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed that. You're um, raising our awareness again to something that many of us are, uh, know about. It's on the periphery of our, our, our knowledge and our tax expertise. These ideas of tax expenditures and the um, lack of information and the diminishing amount of information that's being provided to help us to understand the distributional impact of what are enormous costs in our society is really important. And thank you for thank you for raising that. And I know as we now go into the into the live session, the debate session, uh, there will be a, 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 a huge range of interest uh, from my colleagues attending the conference today uh, to explore this further, both in the UK context, as you've highlighted, and I know we ha have quite a number of people internationally who will be able to draw on what's going on in, in other countries and are any of them doing anything better to uh, 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 both think about the distributional impact of tax expenditures, but also um, uh, just sharing information about the size and nature of these. So once again, uh, Adrian, on behalf of the Tax Research Network, I thank you for, for your time, for your expertise, for your interest and your insight uh, and for sharing with us today uh, uh, these details about something which clearly you have a passion for and a great interest in. Uh, and I know we're continuing to try and deliver that call to arms for all of us 
for the NAO, for the HMRC to actually recognise that this is important and this is important data and important that we as tax researchers um, uh, have this information so that we can analyse it and share it and include it in the debate about what effective tax policy and therefore what effective social policy should look like in the UK. So huge thanks for your time on behalf of, uh, of our organisation uh, today. Thank you very much. Thank you.